Welcome. Um, I'm Anthony Hobley, the Executive Director of the Mission Possible platform. Thank you for joining this SDI 20 session on decarbonizing heavy industries. This session supports the ongoing work of the World Economic Forum and Energy Transition Commission's Mission Possible platform. Before we start, some housekeeping remarks. Please make sure you keep your microphones muted. The Firestarter panel will be live streamed on the website. However, the breakout groups will be held under Chatham House rules. The opening panel will not, so please feel free to share um, on whatever media, uh, social media platforms you would like. Um, use the hashtags SDI20 um, and Mission Possible and feel free to tag at WEF Climate. 2020 is a critical year for climate change action. The COVID pandemic has brought a new context and it's created a new reality, presenting us with both opportunities um, and let's face it, risks. The opportunity for a great reset to rebuild more resilient and climate smart societies. However, the risks of a great locking um, of climate tipping points are equally um, as likely. So as we enter this decisive decade in which emissions must be cut by half to hold one and a half degrees within reach, we need a paradigm shift in the way we think and act on climate. Climate action under the Paris Agreement is tackled primarily by nationally determined contributions, the so-called NDCs, whose scope and influence you might be forgiven for thinking stop at national borders. However, business does not stop at borders and neither do their emissions. China, India, the EU and the United States may operate as individual actors in global climate negotiations, but their economies are powered by global industries with global supply chains, global markets, competitive business models and shared technological pathways. In order to decarbonize the global economy, we must think and act like the global economy. The climate action system therefore needs ambitious national pledges under the Paris Agreement and specific measurable net zero commitments from global industries that would unlock the technological investments essential to decarbonizing the world's largest emitters. That is why the forum launched the Mission Possible platform together with the UN, the Energy Transitions Commission and other leading organizations and governments. The platform is an initiative with over 200 high ambition companies focused on action to decarbonize the most intensive and harder to abate sectors. When these sectors, the backbone of the global economy, get to net zero, they will remove over 30% of global emissions. Perhaps no better example of going from zero to hero. For this to happen, we need to understand what it means in concrete terms to take on and deliver net zero commitments by focusing on the practicalities of, imp of implementation action, not just words. In its new report, Making Mission Possible, Delivering a Net Zero Economy, published last week, the ETC outlines three critical priorities for the 2020s and practical actions that could be the bedrock of any sectoral agreement that nations and non-state parties can commit to in the run-up to COP26 to put net zero within reach by 2050. First, speeding up the deployment of proven zero carbon solutions, clean energy, for example. Create the right policy and investment environments, for example, removing fossil fuel subsidies, carbon pricing, and so forth. Bring in the next wave of zero carbon technologies for harder to abate sectors to market so they can be deployed at scale in the 2030s and the 2040s. For example, by focusing public and private R&D on critical technologies like hydrogen, sustainable fuels, or carbon capture. The objectives of this session are to explore how sectoral industry decarbonization agreements can be developed to both drive ambitious decarbonization as a complement to the efforts to raise climate ambition under the international negotiations pursuant to the UNFCCC process, and secondly, and critically, implemented to ensure a just and inclusive transition. In today's session, we have a game of two halves. The first the first is a short 30 minute fire starter panel with our three excellent panelists I will introduce in a moment, followed by five simultaneous 30 minute breakout sessions 
where we will examine the following questions. And please take careful note of the numbers here if you want to be in a particular session. Number one, sectoral agreements for corporate emissions reduction, which will be led by Ned Harvey, a managing director at the Rocky Mountain Institute. Number two, integration of sectoral agreements in national climate planning to be led by Gonzalo Munoz, the high level climate champion for Chile. Number three, pragmatic approaches to transition financing, which will be led by John Colas, a managing director at Oliver Wyman. Number four, clean growth for economic recovery, led by Cornelius Piper, a managing director at the Boston Consulting Group. And number five, inclusive and socially responsible approaches to decarbonisation, which will be led by Samantha Smith, the director at the Just Transition Centre. If you would like to select a particular breakout session, please include the number of relevant sessions in your Zoom name when you rename yourself with your organisation. Within the limits of ensuring a good spread across these breakout groups, we will do our best to accommodate your preferences. However, I apologise in advance if that is not possible. To conclude, we need a great reset, not a great lock-in. A great reset that will help us build the net zero industry that is critical to our sustainable future. To discuss this in our opening panel, we have three excellent panelists. First, Maria Mendelucci, the Chief Executive Officer of the We Mean Business Coalition. Second, Mad Snipper, the current Chief Executive Officer of Grunfoss and the CEO designate of Orsted, both major Danish companies heavily involved in the transition. Um, and last but by no means least, Samantha Smith, the director of the Tr Just Transition Center, a part of the International Trade Unions Congress. I'd like to first turn to Maria. So Maria, you've been involved in this space for a long time, uh, most recently at WBCSD and now with the We Mean Business Coalition. So you've worked on this from many different angles, industry as well. So with that experience in the space, why do you think we could be optimistic today about decarbonization of industry? And what do you think are the critical enablers in this context of delivering sectoral agreements that we're discussing today? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on this panel with you and the panelists and, and all the audience. Last year we were in New York, this time we do it virtually. Yeah, our footprint is lower and we can be in many places at the same time. So thank you for, for all the team that is making this happening and the people that are on the backstage. I am optimistic, well, some days I'm not, but I'm optimistic today. <laughs> I think the pandemic for the, you know, yeah, it's, 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 it's quite devastating, but it has shown the effect of systemic risk. Uh, and, and, and it has shown that actually, you know, we better be prepared for the next one, uh, climate change or, or nature loss that could have even more devastating impacts. Uh, we see the banks and the finance sector and companies that understand that this is the case and no one uh, wants to see, to own stranded assets. Companies with high ESG uh, activities rate better in the financial market. We see also that the industry is uh, setting targets that are aligned uh, with what science says we need to do with 1.5 degrees and some with two degrees. There are 16 cement companies that have a, a target, targeted science-based targets. The steel companies are also going into that direction. We see that um, we see the how things could evolve in the future. We see that renewables, electric vehicles, battery, uh, when, when the scale happens, the, the costs go down quite exponentially. And we're starting to see some signs that uh, that could happen also with hydrogen, which would be a key solution for these hard to rate sectors. We're seeing that the European Union in the green deals that, uh, and in the stimulus packages are also doubling down their efforts uh, on these hard to rate uh, sectors and, and technologies uh, that are critical and that we need to develop in the next uh, 10 years so that they can deliver in 2030, 2040, as you rightly pointed. So what are the critical enablers? I think there are, in my view, there are five. The first one is demand. Uh, as more companies set science-based targets, they're going to, to want to reduce their scope three emissions and hence they are going to ask for materials that are zero emissions. We have done RE100 at Winning Business, EV100, and now we're going to, to, to start one new that is going called Steel Zero 100. 
and we will have seven zero one hundred, and that will create the demand signal that the companies need to make the investments and and, and to, to attract this um, this demand. The finance, as I mentioned before, no one wants to risk having stranded assets, and this is going to push the out of eight sectors to to go towards cleaner options. The policy regulation is going to take to get tougher. Uh, building codes are going to get tougher, and that uh, the companies know that this is inevitably going forward. Then there is competition. So if one, if it still goes better, then Cement says, listen, I need to also hurry up because if not, I'm going to, to lose the market share in terms of the materials that are chosen for, for the buildings, for example. And finally, uh, one that is a critical level, I think is circular economy. We don't talk enough about it, but this is a win-win opportunity because there is not enough materials to, to meet the demand because uh, it reduces cost uh, for companies and it creates uh, also an opportunity to valorize the, the waste embedded. So I'm positive, but that doesn't mean that we are there. We need to work very hard uh, with the Mission Possible platform uh, to advance on the decarbonization of these sectors. Thank you, Anthony. I think you're on mute, Anthony. <laughs> the keyword. I've said it before, and I think a lot of us have, it's the most quoted phrase of the 2020, of 2020 you're on mute. Um, Mads, so we've heard from Maria um, and the sort of, you know, the, this, this approach, and I, and I think quite a bit of optimism there. You're in business. Um, you've been working um, certainly, you know, across the manufacturing sector with the Danish client, leading the process around the Danish climate uh, partnership on manufacturing. Um, and you have a lot of experience in the business world. So what role um, do companies need the public sector to play to enable sector agreements? I and mean, a lot of the work we're doing is companies stepping up, making commitments, you know, working on roadmaps and key bits of systems demonstration, um, which is, is fantastic. But, but what's the partnership needed with governments um, and with public policy that will enable um, us to reach our you know, collective goals? Thank you very much, Anthony. And thanks a lot for allowing me to, to voice uh, some experiences in this debate. Really, really important and appreciated to, to be invited here. And for thanks to the forum for, for bringing us together. So there are lots of things the public sector can do, as is as there is for the private sector. But I think I'll, I'll let me zoom in on, on three priority things. The, the first thing the public sector can do is to set very bold targets for emissions reductions and not least to engage the private sector in, in how to, to get there. I'll elaborate a little bit on each of them. So that's the first one, both targets and involve the private sector. Second one is under the heading of green tax reform, because there are critical enablers that need to happen, because otherwise it will just be impossible to, to, to get entire sectors to transform. And the third critical enabler is to, to make available massive green, green rebound stimuli. So, so the finance is available for that transformation. Allow me to, to elaborate a little bit based on some of those perspectives. So, so the first one, based on, the, in this case, a tiny country, which is essentially, unfortunately, you could say only 0.1% of the world's emissions in, in Denmark, the government started to set out a 70% uh, carb, uh, carbon emissions reduction target by 2030, which I believe is one of the most ambitious in the world. And the initial reaction was essentially saying, no, that's going to be difficult. That's going to be too expensive. It's probably not right. And then what the, what the government did was they set down 13 climate partnerships across all business sectors and essentially across all sectors, each of them led by a CEO from a Danish uh, company. I had the privilege to chair the one for manufacturing companies. And before, in less than six months, there were actually more than 300 very tangible specific and actionable propose, uh, proposal from those uh, to, 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 to the government. And as we speak, more than a third of those are actually under implementation, enabling a, a sort of a really, really good start to that transition. Obviously, that's just in a small company, but together with some other CEOs, we've actually tried to push that approach as an inspiration to other countries and, and, and sort of unions as, as well. Secondly, uh, on the, the, the green tax reform, even in a relatively progressive country like Denmark, 
they, they are just they, they, the the tax structure simply does not encourage enough sort of sectoral and industry transition. So we have actually a very relatively heavy tax on on uh, on on, uh, on on using surplus heat for manufacturing. We are taxing using electricity for heating. And at the same time, we only for the heaviest sectors actually have any emissions tax, which makes no sense. And that is why one of the one of in our country, one of the things we've been pushing quite aggr aggressively and which is being worked on as we speak is a green tax reform. At the same time, in the alliance of CEO climate leaders, the number one barrier for transition is an insufficient carbon pricing uh, and carbon taxing. Uh, that is that is the clear perception of CEOs from across industries, and that means that in order to get us systematically and systemically moving, we need a higher price on carbon. Many people have said that before me, but it is just a vital, vital enabler for us to have happen. And it is very important that that carbon additional carbon tax income does not go into welfare fair or solving other problems. It should be used to incentivize and drive further financing of uh, the green transition. One of the big topics obviously is, uh, is on the carbon leakage, meaning that if one country makes a car aggressive carbon tax and another one won't, then the leakage is gonna be an issue, which is why we both want the forum, but also we as industries in, as companies and sectors, we need to make a global drumbeat that an international approach to carbon taxing is just vital. We are on it, but we need to do uh, even more. So that's the second topic of green tax reform. And the last one is on massive green rebound stimuli. Uh, right now, there is actually as much as 0.6 trillion dollars uh, available right now to get the economy started again for, for green transition alone. And that is a huge opportunity, not only for, for individual companies, but for sectors to tap into that and to really accelerate, uh, like, like Maria said, there's a unique opportunity of time that actually means we have the opportunity to accelerate right now. But the challenge is that in order to get us just below the two, the two degree increase that we need to, those 0 0.6 need to get to 1.5 to $2 trillion. So just pushing as industries and sectors, pushing uh, our countries and European unions and so on, to ensure that we increase that even further is, is absolutely uh, vital. So many other things can be done such as public purchasing, setting higher demands, higher transparency of emissions. But in, in summary, uh, the, uh, the, the setting bold ambitions involving the private sector, green tax reform and massive uh, green recovery stimuli would be what I think we need the public sector to do the most. Mads, thank you very much. And I mean, this is a, this is something we hear again and again when business has to get on with it. They quite often find ways to do it. And, you know, as, as we're seeing in many cases, you know, it beca it's cheaper than was originally thought. Um, we, we're seeing that now play out in the energy transition. Um, and we're seeing that with many other transitions. But as we know, in all transitions, you know, there are winners and losers. Um, you know, whether that's the, the, the energy transition we're going through, whether that's previous transitions from railways to automobiles or, um, you know, from old style sort of factories to, you know, steam powered factories in the industrial revolution. Um, and in many of those previous transitions, you know, there hasn't always been a system in place to look after the workforce. Um, and when we consider the speed at which we want this transition to go, how do we bring the workforce along with us and ensure that they're part of this transition, particularly as perhaps, you know, this year, even more critically important, you know, um, I think there's a huge mantra around green stimulus, but also, you know, understanding the degree to which that brings jobs and security for, um, people employed in our industries and economy. So Samantha, um, that, that's a good segue um, for yourself. You've been working in this space for quite a while um, and, and I think clearly your work has become even more pertinent um, over the last six months. Um, what are the key considerations that we need to make um, in any sectoral approach to be inclusive? 
um, and ensure that, that what we're driving um, is a just transition um, to decarbonize heavy industry. And I think, as we said earlier, not just for workers, but, but you know, to ensure that no countries are left behind. Thanks, thanks, Anthony. Um, just also to situate myself and where I work. So I work for the International Trade Union Confederation, and we represent more than 200 million organized workers in 162 countries. Um, so some, uh, some of the people who are members in our organizations, they actually sit on the board, Mats, of Ersted, as you know, we have employee representatives on the boards of major, major companies in Denmark and in also in other countries. Um, I also wanna situate what I'm going to say in this crisis, because I think we can't talk about respond, you know, about decarbonizing heavy industry without also understanding that um, the equivalent of 400 million jobs disappeared between April and June globally, and more than 5 million jobs disappeared in Europe at just in Europe at that time, which is almost equivalent to the total number of people employed in European heavy industry. Now, not all of those jobs losses were in heavy industry, but some were, right? Because we're seeing a crisis both of supply and demand, as well as a breakdown pretty much complete of global supply chains across a range of industries. Um, and so, um, so from our perspective, when we're looking at this question of, you know, can we decarbonize, can we decarbonize heavy industry and uh, what do you need to make it a just transition? Like that discussion has to start with jobs, right? There's no conversation that anyone is gonna have with workers and trade unions right now that does not start with good jobs and also uh, include social protection. So a welfare state. So healthcare, so income support, unemployment insurance, and all the things that's, that are making it possible for working people to stay afloat in this crisis. Um, from that perspective, what it takes to get, a, to get decarbonization heavy industry, like the technology is there. We had a round table actually in Sweden a year ago which included uh, SSAB, the Prime Minister of Sweden, Vattenfall, um, and, and of course the unions that, organ that organize in these companies, as well as unions from across Europe and around the world, which was basically about, and we had a representative from Mission Possible explain different pathways for cement and steel. And I, I, you know, I think we all came away from that understanding that yeah, the technology is there. And in some places, like in Sweden, like with SSAB Steel, it is possible to have a transition that's actually creating more good jobs for people, especially in an economically distressed area, which you know, in periods the north of Sweden has been. But it's really going to be a challenge to get it elsewhere. Um, to get that just transition, the labor movement is organized both geographically and by sector. In Europe and also in other countries, we bargain sector agreements all the time, also on things like decarbonization and just transition. So a first starting point would be to look to a global sectoral agreement that includes the industrial union federations that do this kind of bargaining at home. That would be one way to make sure that it's actually a just transition because unions as partners in the world of work, we would be uh, at the table and setting some of the terms. You mentioned this issue about just transition between countries. I mean, I think that that is, that is, that is gonna be a lot harder because we don't really have global rules for trade at the moment, right? That system is more or less broken. And so the discussion as Matt said is really about, you know, carbon trade walls in Europe but then how does that affect the export driven economies versus trying to find some more cooperative way to build agreement across the sector. I think the last thing I wanna say is that I'm, you know, if we take Denmark as an example, um, I'm actually pretty hopeful because uh, not only has Denmark decarbonized its power sector and produced two world leading um, 
enterprises in the area of wind, so Vestas and Ersted, as well as all of the other companies like Runfos that are contributing to a decarbonized Denmark. But when the government announced the 70% target, they didn't just set up you know, CEO tables. Actually, the labor movement went and prepared a roadmap for the government on how to meet this target of 70% emissions cuts by 2035. So as trade unionists, we committed fully to this and we also prepared our own plan for how to do that. And those kinds of developments make me, um, yeah, make it possible to see the potential for just transition and how we might get there. Thanks. So we've got a, a few minutes left. So I'm gonna quick fire one question each. I'll go in reverse order. Um, so Samantha, um, if you were at that negotiating table for a global you know, net zero industry agreement, what would be your top three priorities um, to secure in that agreement on behalf of you know, employees um, and a, a just transition? So very quickly, one, two, three. So one would be within companies, the three key, the three R's, retain, retrain and redeploy. So don't fire your current work uh, workforce and then hire new people. Keep the people you have, retrain them and redeploy them in the company. The second would be that, um, as a couple of people have said, you have to look outside the walls, the walls of individual companies or even at the sector, right? Because people are probably going to need to transition to new good jobs outside the sector. So a sector agreement has to rest on this basis of labor rights, social protection and trying to create good low emission jobs across the economy and not just in one sector. And the last thing would be um, to put labor standards into that agreement. Because where we are right now, people are angry, frightened and desperate. And if they do not see a good future for themselves and their families, also when it comes to big disruptive change like with decarbonization, they're going to reject it. So one way to avoid that is to make sure that all of the jobs in a decarbonized steel or cement sector are good jobs. Thank you, great answer. Um, Mads, so you're going from uh, one of the world's most successful and largest producers of, of pumps, um, so products that have a, a big footprint in terms of, of energy. And, and after you were on one of a previous panel, I went and looked at the pumps in my house and they're all Grinfalls pumps. So must be, uh, must be one of the sort of biggest companies in the world for, for that product. But you're, you're moving to another very interesting company, um, which has actually led the transition. Um, you know, one of the first oil and gas companies to effectively entirely transition out of oil and gas, um, Orsted. So it, it shows that it, it is possible. Industrial transitions don't happen homogeneously, do they? They happen in, in, in sort of hot spots. No industrial transition has happened everywhere at once. So. Should we be focusing on the places where we, we can sort of get those first dominoes to fall, if you like, and scale up the technologies and bring down the costs so that then that transition can flow around the world? Um, is that the model we follow or do we need to sort of do it all at once everywhere? I th Thank you very much, Anthony. I, I think, I mean, the, I, I very much believe in the role of companies and industries being catalysts for, for change and, uh, and a company like Ørsted has, has indeed been sort of one of the catalysts for proving that offshore wind can actually not only work, but can be, be very economically viable as an alternative to, to fossil fuels. And, and I think we, we can't rely only on a few technologies. Uh, Denmark has very successfully been supportive of wind technology, which has fostered not only big leading companies like Ørsted and Vestas, but also led to a fact that there is now a global cluster of wind, to, to wind uh, energy uh, technology and, and competence in the country. I very much believe that as we globally can build clusters within different technologies, such as hydrogen, solar panel, uh, energy storage, and so on, I don't think we should just focus on a few, but I think individual countries and regions should probably try to build up world-class competency centers because that's the best way to structurally build a global competency rather than everybody competing against each other and the same technologies. That would probably not get the world to where we need in, in a 10 or, or 30 year perspective. Thank you. Again, really quick answer. Thank you for that. Um, Maria, 
we are out of time, but uh, I'm going to give you the chance for a very quick answer. The how do we? What is the role of civil society um, in in a, in a sense helping industry across sectors to 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 work together and deploy synergies, whether that's energy, whether that's creating demand, uh, whether it's you know getting industry working together on the key policy asks that they they need. Um, is that a critical role for civil society, or is civil society's role to stand on the outside and put pressure on companies? To transition, or is it a bit of both? Well, I think, I think at least uh, from where I sit, uh, obviously it's it's very important that the role of business organization like Women Business Coalition, the World Economic Forum, the World Business Council, to align efforts to be the neutral broker because between companies that fiercely compete, and that's what they need to do to be the best. And and now we see a competition to be the best in getting to net zero but that inevitably they need to collaborate uh, to get to net zero, that they need each other. So I think a um, key role to play in, in helping facilitate these coalitions of uh, companies that cross across sectors, within the sectors, but also across sectors. Thank you. Um, you're all very well trained uh, for panelists. So thank you for those short, sharp, but very uh, informative answers. Um, we're about to go into the, the breakout sessions. So before we do so, um, I don't know how you're in the sort of virtual world, thank our panelists in a sort of traditional way, but uh, um, I think we all know how, uh, how to do that, we're learning. Um, final reminder, if you do have a preference for any of the breakout sessions, quickly uh, renumber yourself. Otherwise, don't worry, you will find yourself in one of the breakout sessions. There are five excellent um, questions. Um, we have a chance, we have a couple of minutes where we can take a quick look um, at the, this fantastic um, uh, visualization that Lucia has been working on. I don't know if we can sort of share that on the main screen so everyone can see it a bit more clearly. Because um, I, I can see a very fantastic, oh, here we go. So these are some, I think, the key things that have come out, the key role of the public sector, um, collaboration, um, economic, economic viability, circular economy, I, I agree. Uh, the point I think Maria made, you know, we need to do a lot more on the circular economy. Um, it's a key part of decarbonizing many of the material sectors, for example, and perhaps a key opportunity for many of the heavy transport sectors to be a part of that. Paradigm shift, um, think and act like a global economy. Um, the pandemic, I think it was a really good point, the pandemic has shown the effects of systemic risk, but I, I think it, this word wasn't used, but for my many years in this space, inertia there is, has been the common retort, but we can't do it, you know, we, we can't change that quickly. Um, this is the way we've done things, you know, we need to change slowly. I mean, we have learned, if nothing else, in the last six months, how quickly we can change when we are faced with a threat. Um, and then perhaps it's that key issue of understanding the threat that climate change poses that will unlock that ability for us to move quickly. Uh, renewables has become quick, has become, sorry, become cheaper um, at scale. Can we repeat that across many of the technologies we need in, in this space? Carbon pricing and tax, I mean, a very clear call for that from MADS. Um, acceleration and pushing harder. I like the three R's from Samantha, retain, retrain, redeploy, um, really important part of the just transition. Um, starting with social protection, perhaps what about a social contract? Do we need a, do we need a new social contract that is part of this transition? Um, with that thought, um, we're gonna go off and have some of those interesting conversations um, in our own breakout groups. Um, but thank you again to the panelists.